I'm afraid the TV guide comes to Chenandler Bar. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of What the Hell Happened to Them? This season of Title Fights Brewing. That's right, Eddie Murphy versus Jim Carrey. I am your host, Patrick Scahill, and joining me on the line is a man with a kickin' silhouette, Joe Vickman. Oh, well thank you. I never felt like that. I know. Hmm. It's, <laughs> you know, you should look at your silhouettes more, my friend. Well, I guess I should. And on the audio boards, it's Lev Van Rensselaer reminding me to remind you that you can email the cast at whathappentothemcast at gmail.com. And our sponsor this week is Yankee Strudel and Candy, the most patriotic German cuisine you can find this side of a river that is uh, not the Rhine. All right, Joe, mm. what movie are we doing this week? We got to hang out, not literally, with Eddie Murphy, and we watched 1986 The Golden Child. Yes, what happens in uh, the action Last Emperor? Do you think that's what they were going for? No, I don't. That's, that's a me thing. I've never seen The Last Emperor, so. Uh, a private detective specializing in missing children is charged with the task of finding a special child whom dark forces want to eliminate. I mean, uh, yeah, that, that happened. I agree. That, happened. that was a very 80s plot that was described to me right there. I'm going to tell you, I didn't get to refresh yeah. on this from last week when I watched it, because I was yeah. we, I was a sick. That's behind the curtain. <laughs> Very sick last week. <laughs> well, you've opened the curtain and let us know that. Yes. Hi! I'm, I was sick. <laughs> yeah, I was sick the end. That's why you got a remix episode last week, everybody. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, but what I do remember very vividly is that what... They, they, do they really say that he was a detective? Because I only really remember them, him saying, I look for children that are missing. He just kept stating that over and over again. He never said he was a detective. That, did he? Nope. I don't even know if that's what detectives do. Yeah, he's a private private eye, whatever. There's like a sub category, of, a specialization of detective that's in like kidnapping children back. Mm. Unkidnapping them. Unkidnapping. But, you know, here's what I'll say. Tell me. This movie's very stupid. Yeah? <laughs> it's a very dumb, stupid movie, and I was annoyed at watching it. Yeah. Did you get to watch those, um, one of those interview clips with, uh, what's his name? Letterman that I sent oh, you? Oh, no. I totally okay. spaced on that. I was going to wait until, like, you were ready to go, and yeah, then you I'm just sorry. weren't, and then I forgot. <laughs> That's okay. It's my fault. I will fill you in, though, because... Did he come out and was like, yeah, this movie was dumb, but they offered me $2 million. No, but he's very nervous. And also, he's like 24, 25. He's so young. And Letterman's just like, so what do you got to do with all this money? And then, uh, <laughs> tell me about your cars. And then Eddie Murphy's just kind of taking it back a little bit. And he's like, do you ask all the black guys this these questions or is this or is this just like or like you know is this like just aimed towards me or is this like he's just like oh no i didn't mean it like that and it's just like so eddie murphy's kind of like already like on the back of his heels and he's like what what do you is this like am i being set up as like am i, I don't want to be um like typecast as like this person and He's just kind of always on guard. Person who likes cars. No, just like he like the, the he doesn't want to be the black guy that likes like expensive cars and he buys all the expensive cars and everything. And like he and then he's just like the interview's so black strange. Black guys and Jay Leno, you know. No Letterman. No, no, but I'm, Leno buys all the expensive cars. Oh so yes, black yes, guys. yes, yes. It was a weird interview, and Eddie Murphy was very, very on guard. And uh, I don't. It went on for like twenty minutes. Like I guess it was like a normal interview. <laughs> but yeah. the whole time he's he's just kind of very private and he's i just didn't know how young he was he's so young like yeah i know i can't imagine being just in that spot like that young it's crazy david letterman sort of notable uh dickhead in his the the earlier years of was his career. he all right i didn't know that i thought that was later on yeah, yeah. he's kind of got like more like people will be like oh it's endearing but uh, you know I, if somebody was like yeah i don't want him to be a dickhead to me while i'm being interviewed I, 
I'd understand. Yeah. <laughs> And then in the clip where he's supposed to like set up, uh, like he's supposed to set up a clip, and then the whole time he's like, "I don't know what clip this is," and he's like, "You didn't show me what clip it is," and he's like very confused. And then he's he sees the clip that they finally show, and he's like, "That wasn't very funny," you know. <laughs> you guys didn't like really give me a funny clip. <laughs> and uh, Eddie, so Eddie Murphy is really kind of hostile at the time, like not like he's not like being mean, but he's just kind of like, uh, did you guys like set me up to fail here or like what's, what's going oh, on? He's here? not doing the, the, the news cable thing where like they're trying to set him up as the angry black guy. No, so they're not pulling that one. That's nice of them. Yeah. They're just like, what they, they think he's going to come out and just be like slamming them with jokes all the time. But he's just like kind of very reserved and like, he's, he's got it like as Eddie Murphy laugh a couple times, but it's, a very strange, odd interview. Yeah, just wanted to give a little context on that because the movie did fairly well. Well, I wish it hadn't, but it, I, I, I don't know. It seems like a product that would come out in the mid '80s, so yes, <laughs> I'm not terribly surprised. It also is interesting. I've, I've started to be able to like, even if I didn't know which actor's movie we were getting every week, mm-hmm. the opening music can usually be a good giveaway. Yeah. Right, like this. This had like the Eddie Murphy like bass vibe thing going on. Is this the one that sounded like it was ripping off Midnight Run? It sounded like it was ripping off Midnight Run and his previous movie, Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, it's just like this kind of like sleuthing jazz. Yeah, music. maybe that's just an eighties. It's a thing. little bit of uh, yeah, <laughs> but Jim Carrey doesn't have that in his movies. It's tr- well. I'm going to be on the lookout now for this Eddie Murphy bass line, because that seems to be how I can tell. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, though, has Eddie, uh, has Jim Carrey had movies that made enough money to actually get a, a new score? <laughs> a score. <laughs> what was the Jim Carrey one we did last night? Oh, Peggy Sue something, something. Oh, yeah, that yeah. one had something, yeah. That was, yeah. like, the first one. <laughs> but not, like, a headliner yeah. for him. The uh, Once Bitten had some kooky music, too, it but did. it wasn't this Eddie Murphy bass line, this hip like. I mean, what's <laughs> been also is like, it feels like another Canadian production. <laughs> like, it doesn't feel Hollywood enough. <laughs> <laughs> the film was intended as a serious adventure drama with Mel Gibson in the lead role. Oh, baby. After Gibson turned down the film, Eddie Murphy replaced him. The script was rewritten as a partial comedy. Partial is the key word there. <laughs> That's... <laughs> George Miller was Eddie Murphy's first choice for director. Wow. Looks like Eddie Murphy's watching some movies then. Because how, how many how many George Miller movies were out there at this point? Just Mad Maxes, right? He hadn't made a... Yeah, he only had made the, the three Mad Max movies. Because he hadn't made a... Which is of Eastwick yet, because that was next year with Jack. Your favorite. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> it also explains the Mel Gibson connection. He turned it down because Murphy kept him waiting at a meeting for four hours. Wow. I would do the same. Can you imagine if George Miller made this, though? That'd be weird. I'd like it. <laughs> Might have been directed better, though, at least. Yeah. Well, I think Michael Michael Richie's Four hours? Yeah. You kept the dude waiting? What an asshole. <laughs> Here I am feeling bad for you because Letterman's being a dickhead to you. You're being a dickhead to George Miller. Well, in fairness, uh, t- this is like about a year probably before that whole Letterman interview. Preempted dickery from Eddie Murphy. Uh, in an interview for Fangoria number 113, Charles Dance explained how movie how the movie was drastically changed by Paramount after the first test screening. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> uh, initially, The Golden Child was a very interesting script with a lot of resonances, but Paramount uh, basically chickened out. When they first screened it, it was a very different sort of film for Eddie Murphy. Paramount took too much notice of the preview audience's unease about the unfamiliarity of Eddie's character. They had gotten to know him so well through Beverly Hills Cop that they wanted the character to be much more like that. So the studio went back and reshot a lot of the footage of Eddie doing Eddie Murphyisms and put them into the picture. They took out a really sumptuous, weird, and beautiful score by John Williams and replaced it with something more funky. So basically, when you what you got was Beverly Hills Cop in Tibet. That was a good quote by Charles Dance. Beverly Hills Cop in you Tibet. You know what? I really I did think that. Hmm. I'm like, oh, I guess Eddie Murphy somehow got stuck in this role for a while. But it looks like they just wanted him in the role. Yeah. They just said, I... Uh, this guy was in the biggest movie a year ago. Yeah, and they're like, well, why don't we just do that again? Again. <laughs> yeah. We got it. Let's just do it. it again. <laughs> Let's just do it again. I don't under... Like, 
You're right. And then next year there'll be the sequel. Like he's he's done he's done this role three times now. It's crazy. Back to back. What the fuck? <laughs> the you assholes. The first Eddie Murphy movie to get rated PG-13 from an absence of F words typical in Murphy's 80s and early 90s movies. John Carpenter was offered the job as director. He later went on to direct the similar film Big Trouble in Little China. The same year. Same year. Similar feels strong. Does it feel strong to you? I'm, I'm reading an editorial of it. Not my, not my words. <laughs> I didn't think they were your words, but as that as we comment on those words, mm-hmm. do you think the two movies are similar? Uh, not at all. <laughs> okay. As long as we're on the same page here. Yeah. That I'm not missing something in no. either movie. Very different movies. Because I believe Kurt Russell's set up to be like a big buffoon, not like the action hero. And Eddie Murphy's supposed to yeah, be the action hero. Yeah, but Eddie Murphy's not set hero. up to be an action hero. That's right. He's the guy looking for missing kids. He's supposed to save the day, though. Yes, I know. But I, but if I, when I see him trying to have this interview where they're like, he wants to just talk about this missing kid, I'm not expecting he's going to be the chosen one in a prophecy who's going to do some weird dagger ritual and then fight a demon at the end of it. Uh, that wasn't the world I was expecting. And also, he beats <laughs> up bikers. I didn't... <laughs> I did not know I was in for all of that. <laughs> well, um, that's a good point. <laughs> very, very good point. <laughs> you know, in the beginning of uh, Beverly Hills Cop, he's he's doing action stuff from the very beginning. I say, okay. Yeah, he's like, like he's flying off the I truck. Say, okay. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That's a good Private way to Private eyes it. do not do action things. They're not. This isn't. I don't know where that info thought came out there. That's they're just like Heidi people. They're like good at hiding and looking and spying and going through your trash. Yeah, he's gonna, he's supposed to be looking for the clues. Yeah, he's supposed to tell your girlfriend if if you're if you're cheating on her, if you're just going to dinner to have KFC and go see a movie by yourself. Exactly. <laughs> but this woman just sees him on the news and goes, oh, "He's been chosen by destiny. Let me go talk to the Naga lady." And I just don't buy it. <laughs> Um, well, and then he falls in love with her after four days. Like you, you, ne- you haven't even had a conversation with her. <laughs> Very fair. <laughs> I agree. But you know, we get this cool little uh, Pepsi dance sequence, Pepsi can dance sequence. Pepsi can. Oh, yeah. Remember that? <laughs> so I'm like, ah, that that kind of had me for a little bit. <laughs> that was like, yeah, yeah. That kind of had me. Fun. And then it's like it's like ah oh, look it's Pepsin on the Ritz and then the other guy the 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 crunk guy from Goonies is like oh yeah it's fun and then he turn you know and then he's on your side later <laughs> do you mean chunk chunk <laughs> yeah I haven't seen the movie in I don't know twenty years probably longer twenty five years so. yes I wish we would get a crunk uh, chunk what's the thing the truffle shuffle yeah he did the truffle shuffle. Shovel Shuffle? It's fun. Doesn't seem nice to him. It doesn't. <laughs> After this, Eddie Murphy would write his next five movies in a row. His own movies? His own movies. Smart plan. Very smart. I did notice he had his own production company here, or loan out company, whatever tax thing it's meant to be doing. Really? What's it called? Do you know? Did you catch I it? I don't know. I just, uh, no, it was a week ago, but I saw, uh, he's got a production company now. Took him four movies, five movies, good work. I know. <laughs> he's already got it. He's just like Sandler. You know how I know the role wasn't originally written for Eddie Murphy? Because his character's name was Chandler. <laughs> no one thought to change that one around when they were doing all the other reruns. Is his huh? name really Chandler? <laughs> oh, yeah. Chandler. And they, like, they kept calling him some like funky name. They, they, they kept messing up his name in it. I remember that. That was like a bit they were doing. Yeah. If there's something that kills a plot erection faster in a movie, it's a... Uh, it's, uh, Prophecies. Prophecies are just the worst thing to happen to your movie. Because the problem is, even if something goes wrong, it could all be part of the prophecy. You don't know. That's the beauty of the prophecy. It's whatever it needs to be whenever your plot needs it to be. Um. You know? There it is. (laughs) The magic rules are all kind of generic. I don't know how anyone's doing magic or why, but they do it. A teaser trailer was released in the summer of 1986 featuring no footage from the film, consisting of Eddie Murphy riding a yak through a blizzard complaining, If I'm the chosen one, how come I'm, I'm freezing while you're sitting in a warm movie theater? Chosen one, my behind. Why couldn't someone choose me to go to the Bahamas? To jokes that were to get home by five. <laughs> I get it. I also, if I'm in a movie theater and uh, I get shown a movie trailer that 
is refuses to show any clips from the movies, I think, well, you just clearly not a good movie. <laughs> well, we didn't know that yet because we hadn't seen the movie yet. If the studios are so terrified <laughs> of showing me clips from the movie, yeah, you must think that they're bad clips. If you cannot find a minute's worth of trailer footage... It gets better. Uh, Vilmo Sigmund did the cinematography for the teaser, which remains unreleased officially on home video, even missing from the 2020 Paramount Presents Blu-ray. Oh, but was finally made available on YouTube in 2021 via amateur film scanner, Denise Carl Robidow. Well, I said your name right. You're doing the Lord's work, just like Media Junkie Josh, doing for the Drew Carey Show. <laughs> And then my last little piece of uh, trivia for you is that Charlotte Lewis was only 18 when she filmed this movie, which Eddie Murphy also calls out in that Letterman interview that she was 18. Very young. These kids are young. And he's like, yeah, I felt really creepy about crushing on her. I get, yeah, I mean, he's pretty young himself. It's not, it's not like totally out of the I realm. I know he's young too, but there's some, eight, I don't know. I know, eight, I agree. 18 and 24, you're in such very different spots in your yeah, life. Yeah, very, very, Like, yeah. she's 18, she's legally an adult. I would not call her an adult. <sighs> yeah, if, I'm trying to like, remember just her character. It's, I would not have guessed she was 18. She, it, it did not appear that way Yeah, she demeanor. she acts more like, like, adult-like, but, because. Yeah. But. Yeah, she's very, very young. If you had said if you had said she and Eddie Murphy were both in like their late twenties, I'd buy it. Yeah, <laughs> the budget on this is is a little absurd. Uh, it ranges from twelve to twenty four and a half million. We don't know how much the dumb, stupid skeleton costs. So <laughs> is, you know, is that a reason why it would range like that? It's, it's, it's either twelve or know. double the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're like, it was going to be $12 million, and then we had to do a bunch of reshoots and make a trailer. Yes. So it went whoop right up there. It made domestically $79 million and worldwide $149. It's probably good you pivoted away from the action stuff, because the action stuff you did was really bad. Like, when he's got to do his, like, test to go get this dagger. Mm -hmm. He seemed to figure that out in five seconds pretty easily. And then you have, like, this big climax... And then it was over. And I went, oh, okay, well, I guess we're done. We have this Tibetan, I don't know, like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. It was all stupid. Like, I, I could pick apart the little sh stupid shit, but ultimately it was all stupid anyway. So, like, why am I bothering to split hairs on the stupid sandwich? So, I don't know if you remember this, because this was two weeks ago now, the story that we the were The story unfolding. about Mike Ritchie's last movie. You wanted to talk oh, about? Oh, yes. Okay, good. You do remember? <laughs> I've got the note right here. I was ready to go. So he made a a, a great wealth of movies throughout the... Uh, he started in 69, and he went to 1997. 1997 was his last movie. Do you know what his last movie was? Can I tell you what his last movie was? Yes, that's why I thought we were doing the whole thing. Yes, his last movie was uh, a little tiny movie that I saw on the Disney Channel back in the 90s called A Simple Wish, starring Martin Short, Mara Wilson, and Kathleen Turner. <laughs> yeah. What's in that? What happens in that movie? Mara Wilson is trying to... Uh, I think she wants her dad to get this acting role yeah her dad's an aspiring actor and she, he wants her to uh, she wants him to win the leading role in the broadway musical so she like makes a wish and then she gets her fairy godmother and her dad's martin short well her no her fairy godmother is her fairy godfather and that's martin short yeah, martin short <laughs> yes okay. and what's kathleen turner doing in she's this? she's the evil witch who na somehow <laughs> controls <laughs> everything <laughs> <laughs> uh, is Martin Short the bad guy in the Santa Claus thing? Uh, one of them, yes. He's, uh, I believe, in the third one. He is Jack Fla Frost. Jack Frost, yes. He's had a weird career. He has. Very strange. Um, Michael Ritchie, though, his first movie, Downhill Racer. Have you heard of Downhill Racer? Yes. Uh, I watched it a few years ago. Maybe that's where I heard it from. Yeah. Skiing movie starring Redford and Gene Hackman. Well, I I like those actors, but that a skiing movie sounds like it'd be boring. <sighs> I, they're skiing. <laughs> they're skiing in it. It's it's more about action res rescuing a skier from an avalanche yeah. or something. I haven't watched this movie in like five years, probably. 
I need to watch it again because I don't remember it. But yeah, he works with Hackman and Redford a bunch. Couldn't get him for the Disney movie though, right? No. <laughs> I don't think I don't think Hackman's signing up for any Disney movies in the nineties. <laughs> He he signed up for one Raver Romano movie, and he's like, "I'm out." <laughs> Bye. That Hollywood. wasn't in the nineties. <laughs> Pretty close. But Michael Ritchie did the Bad News Bears. He does the Fletch movies. You know him. Cops and Robertsons. Come on. He's he's, <laughs> well, he's Chevy's guy for a while. <laughs> yes, it sounds like it. <laughs> but yeah, he he had an interesting career. It just kind of ended on a. A, a fart. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Kathleen Turner thought the same thing. Well, I mean, like, I'm doing this now, huh? I was in Pritzy's honor, for God's I sake. I mean, this is where we were talking about. <laughs> they've all, they've she all was landed also here. In Gaslit. Oh, really? Kathleen Turner was in not Gaslit. No, White House Plumbers. White House Plumbers. Oh, uh, okay. That was the one I didn't watch. No, I know. But it was around the time we did Pritzy's honor, so I was like, whoa. Let's see. What else? Do I have anything else for you? Hmm. No, the movie sucked. The end. Ah, uh, you want to know how this movie's old, though? It's not a great one this time, but okay. just a couple. The Pepsi cans are red and white. <laughs> Haven't seen that in a long time. Oh, yeah, because they're blue. Remember those days? Yeah. And now it's, like, blue, but it used to be, like, mostly white with, like, a red stripe and a blue, like, yin-yang symbol. We got, uh, large daggers can be easily brought onto a plane. <laughs> Couldn't do that now. <laughs> <laughs> that would be much harder to do. He he made it work. For, they didn't obviously want him to take it onto the plane, but he snuck it in pretty easily. Maybe if it retracts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In-flight headphones are giant stethoscopes. Glad we don't have to deal with that anymore. Oh yeah. They're just like bring your own shit. We don't want you to. What this like? It's like plugged into like your thing above you. Not doing any of that. Yeah, no, that, those looked awful and uncomfortable. I know, yes, like it was like a cartoon. They were bright and orange, and you, so you can watch like the one movie everybody has to watch. Ugh. No, no that way. <laughs> that sounds miserable. <laughs> you better be starting at the same yeah. time. <laughs> and yeah, there you go. That's it. See, not a great one, but we got something. What do you I got? Have one more thing for you regarding the box office. Released in December 1986, The Golden Child was a box, o- box office success. It earned uh, $79 million in the United States alone, making it the eighth biggest film of the year. Oh, come on! So, uh, Eddie Murphy says, My pictures make their money back. No matter how I feel, for instance, about The Golden Child, <laughs> which was a piece of shit, the movie made more than $100 million. So why? who am I to say it sucks? After The Golden Child... Murphy would, uh, yeah, we said it, per, would participate in uh, the writing of many of his films. All right. Well, at least he and I are on the same page. Yeah. And then, despite its commercial success, the film did not meet Paramount's expectations when compared to Murphy's previous film, Beverly Hills Cop, which earned $234 they like, million. They were like, what? Why is this the same? Eddie, you didn't, you didn't make the highest grossing film of the year again? <laughs> you idiot. Get out of here. What would have been in 86? What is 86? I can't even think. Well, I'm going to look it up. You look it up while I tell you Roger Ebert's review of this movie. (laughs) Roger, Roger, Roger. Roger, 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 Roger. R-O-G-E-R. Perfect. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times gave the film... Three out of four stars. Oh, come on, <laughs> and he doesn't even like it. Roger. And stated, the Golden Child may not be the Eddie Murphy movie we were waiting for, but it will do. <laughs> well, are you sure? Because they worked really hard to make it that. <laughs> but it will do is such a great line. <laughs> <laughs> it will do. You gave it three stars. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, right? He's, he's giving it like a very high grade on this. Uh, it is funnier, more assured, and more tailored to Murphy than Beverly Hills Cop. Well, Roger doesn't know comedies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it shows a side of his comic persona that I don't think has been much appreciated. His essential underlying sweetness. Murphy's comedy is not based on hurt and aggression, but on affection and understanding that comes from seeing right through the other characters. But what about Leonard Maltin? You like Leonard Maltin? 
I he's okay. Yes, I that's, 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 yeah. that's, don't be to me to him. <laughs> I throw, what? He well, you agree with him more. He gave it a bomb, his lowest possible rating. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> a top candidate for the worst mega hit of all time. Charlotte Lewis gives a wooden performance even for an X model. <laughs> Entire reels go by with a hardly a chuckle, a box office smash. <laughs> but have you ever met anyone who says they liked it? Jesus, uh, Janet Maslin of the <laughs> Janet Maslin of the New York Times uh, seemed to agree, describing the picture as a comedy without laughs. That's what it was mean. I like that the movie is so. That's how you know this movie's old because he's commenting on the amount of reels that the movie has that they're switching out the reels of film during the projection you like that one all right that's good i'm into that one well all right the golden child did we like it not really hold on you want to hear what the highest grossing film is tell me i'm gonna say two words to you and you are going to instantly know what it is are you ready Uh uh-huh Ready for these two words, Joe? Okay, eighty. I just danger zone. Oh, Top Gun. Top Gun. It's Top Gun. Eighty. Top yeah, Gun, that makes the sense. Highest grossing film of that year. Okay. Followed by. Give me the top five. I'm gonna say two more words to you. Okay. I'm gonna say two more words to you. You tell me what. Down under. Oh God. <laughs> Crocodile Dundee. You got it. <laughs> oh God. Wow, that's crazy. Number two. Number Paul two. Hogan. <laughs> Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> Paul Hogan and a bunch of people I've never heard of. That's that's great. Good for him. All right. The uh, Karate Kid Part 2. Wow. Ralph Macchio. All right. Number four. So back to school with Rodney Dangerfield. Wow. Good for him. Look at these comedies up there. All right, and number five, hmm. also a sequel, hmm. Aliens. Oh, that's excellent. Good, good for that one. Yes, right, right underneath it, uh, the color purple at number six, which we saw. What? What? Th- wow! 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 Now this is just the calendar gross, mm-hmm. which I don't know how it's different from the in-year release. When you go by calendar gross, Golden Child is not on here. Interesting. Oh, maybe it's it ends. So that movie came on December, and then once December ends, that's the end of that calendar year. For so, calendar gross. It could be because it, so here's what the top handful are for in year release: Top Gun, Crocodile Dundee, mm-hmm. both distributed by Paramount, mm-hmm. Platoon, oh, Karate Kid Part Two up, no down, right down, down, yeah, d- from three to four, mm-hmm. yeah, because. Platoon sneaks in the middle there. Then Star Trek Four bumps up from seven to five. Huh. Then back to school. Then aliens. Hmm. Then the golden child. Huh. Then whatever Ruthless People is, and then Ferris Ruthless Bueller. People. That's a Norman Jewison movie starring Danny yeah, DeVito. You're ready to go on that, <laughs> Danny DeVito, Judge Reinhold. Hey, Judge Reinhold, getting some work again. Am I cr- hold on, I'm not wrong about that, am I? Hold on, I think I. Bette just- Midler, Bill Pullman. No, I'm thinking of a different... You know what? What is... Hold on. There's another Ruthless... Oh, here, here, here are the directors. Jim, Abraham, Jim Abrahams, it's David Zucker, and Jerry yeah, Zucker. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I'm thinking of something else. What am I thinking of, though? With Danny DeVito. Oh, this is going to drive me crazy now. Oh, no. Okay, I'm wrong. Sorry. Yeah, you just made it up. That's fine. I didn't make it up. I just got it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're a big liar, and you're wantonly deceiving the audience. I got you. I didn't mean to. You're going to be indicted for fraud. That's fine. Fuck. How did it come to this? (laughs) It's a slippery slope, Joe. (laughs) I fell down the mountain. Well, I'm done talking about this movie. I didn't like it very much, and I was annoyed at having to watch it. Yeah. I think I was just confusing that that Danny DeVito's in it. Yes, he is in it. (laughs) That's it. That's all I got right. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, the movie sucked. I didn't like it. It was boring. The movie sucked. It's a really bad Eddie Murphy movie. Yeah. Really bad. They said they added Murphyisms into it. I say I didn't feel Eddie Murphy was in it at all. He had some, and like the there were quieter moments where you would. It's it felt like he was just kind of riffing. Yeah. Which I could buy based on the development strategy of the movie. 
<laughs> You're like, oh shit, uh, yeah, just Eddie, figure it out as you go. He's like, oh, oh we. So I think, yep, the, the Paramount was an idiot in trying to salvage. I don't know if the script was any good before it was going to be Eddie Murphy, like that one person said, but you certainly didn't make it better. Nope. And you then you got grumpy that it didn't. Your movie's a box office hit and it's not big enough. You are such jerks. I know. What number an 80s eight. thought. You're number eight in the whole fucking year and you're like, meh. Should have been number one. Well, maybe you should have made a good movie. Then maybe it would have done better. Maybe be grateful that your shitty movie made a lot more than whatever the stupid tank movie he was in was called. Exactly. Right? Because that's usually what happens when you make a shitty fucking Eddie Murphy movie. You get that. Let me tell you. Made more than Peggy Sue Got Married. Same year. (laughs) Yeah, man. Wow. I'm, I'm sort of bad movies all around this year. Peggy Sue got married, not even in the top ten of whatever version of the thing you wanted. No. We had to watch a Nichols movie, right? Aha! Heartburn! Not, that's not in the top ten. <laughs> not in the top ten. We didn't. <laughs> I'm just going through like 86 movies that we covered. That stupid Itsy Bitsy Spider song movie. Oh, uh, yeah? What's that one? That was that movie. That was that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Itsy Bitsy Spider Wait up the water spout It was that movie Alright, last looks? Yeah, give me give me your last looks, I'm, I'm getting out of here <laughs> Wow <laughs> I'm, d- I'm done, I'm done with the golden child You were very upset about this one uh, Last looks, let's say that uh, Eddie, maybe stay away from the fantasy genre For a while And it, I think it's a great idea that you are going to be writing your own movies. Good for you. <laughs> if you have that power, go for it. Do it. I, that's a great idea. What's your last looks, Pat? My last looks? Why is Eddie Murphy in this movie? Well, I don't know. The last time he made a shitty movie was easy. They offered him a crap load of money for not a lot of work. And then he sh- shat all over it on SNL. <laughs> and he shat all over it, which is fine because it was shitty. This one, I guess it's still a lead role, right? He hasn't gotten many lead roles yet. Not yet, really. This is his second lead role. Yes, where he's headlining the movie. When did Beverly Hills Cop, was, was that 84? 84. And this is his okay. next movie. Well, I get, he knew that was a big hit, so... But it's the, right, it's the second, it's the very first one you take after it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. They're going to change the script for you, and then I guess they didn't do it enough. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's just to, to keep keep rolling on the star train, right? Take the roles, I guess. Maybe, I don't know what else was coming to you at that time. Hmm. Man, what is this movie? It was so stupid. Oh, God. I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> so dumb. All right. Well, I'm over it. All right. What was it? Yankee, Yankee Strudel and Candy? Go go get there, I guess. We're not mad at them anymore, so it's fine. You don't need to settle for your, your freedom candy anymore. It's okay. It's all wow. good. Wow. They have a good economy. Uh, I'd like to thank Lev Van Rensselaer for mining those audio boards and keeping the sound so slippery smooth. I'd like to thank Joe Veckman for stopping by. No, oh, thank you for having me. And I am your host, Patrick Scale. You can find my features, documentary, short films, video essays, animations, behind-the-scenes footage, and so much more at quixoticunited.com and social media, presumably with a similar-sounding name. Thank you all for listening. Joe, say goodnight. Good night. Well, Joe, I... Yes, go on. I, I see what you uh, were talking about with Abigail. <laughs> yeah, bullshit. I fucking hate when they do that. I haven't seen that in like in a like in a really long time where it's just like, oh, you've completely mismarketed your own movie, you dumb fucks. <laughs> it is... I, I thought that it might be something like that. I'm like, oh, are they trying to... Yeah. Is it from Dust Till Dawn Us? Yeah, exactly. But then I was like, for for I don't know, for a little bit I was like, well, but maybe you don't, you have no film to market then, right? Because you got, but mm-hmm. then like it took forty five minutes for the vampire thing to even come so up. So long. And I was and I was paying attention to the first forty five minutes, and I was like, oh you, no, you, I could see how you do it, right? You're like, oh, we capture this girl, oh no, but her girl's a, a evil criminal, and he's sending an assassin mm-hmm. to kill us.
Very, very doable. And they just went, eh, yeah, it's already called Abigail. Let's just put a vampire ballerina on the cover and be done. It's that's that. So a couple of like aggressively meta jokes in the in the film in the trailer and like ah ha ha look we we are vampire referential yeah. ah ha 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 we're getting tired of that too. Just kind of a bummer. I like those filmmakers. They've they've done interesting spins on on that genre before, but like they're like and you got uh, this lazily marketed Watergate guy. Watergate guy. Well, Gaslit guy. Oh, Dan Stevens. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't call him the Godzilla guy now, because he's just popping up in all the Godzilla and Kong movies. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> he's he's that Something guy. About that. He'll always be get. He'll always be uh, John. Jesus, what the fuck is his name? John. It's been so long since I've got Dean. John Dean. Thank you. Oh, Not wow. in my Watergate game. You're welcome. Yeah. You watched a hundred Watergate movies. I watched like six uh, hours of that show. <laughs> yeah, jeez. Was it six hours? I'll just have to read my book again, my Watergate tome. Refresh myself <laughs> on everything. <laughs> you got really into it last year. Do you know what this thing is this year yet? That, it was organic. I can't make a thing happen. Oh, okay. Is that how it yeah, works, Yeah, you know what? You Joe. got into Watergate last year, and I got into basketball. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was a weird year. <laughs> We're out cruising for chicks. You're like, hey, girl, would you like to dribble on my court? And I'm like, hey, would you like to violate my constitution? Oh. <laughs> we also just sound like a couple of white guys in their 50s. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Just, just oh, started getting the basketball and Watergate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you should smile more. You'd look pretty. Oh. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's talk about things. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm. Hey. Oh, nope. I nope. need a break.